option or can you paste it into the chat? Yeah, so um, I couldn't find exactly what it was I wrote in the last chat in the executive committee. So I did uh, kind of put something together a few moments ago that I, that I hope uh, will will meet with everyone's uh, everyone's approval here. Let, let me let me get this here. Um, yeah, control C, Control V. I, I can I can pull that chat log Ray. That's not that big of a deal. Yeah, okay. I have it. So I, I, I kind of put it into a, a format if. Um, which lends itself to this. You know, if you take a quick read of that, Jeremy, and if you feel like it doesn't capture what we had talked about, then um, yeah, happy to, to substitute that for whatever else you have. And in, in fact, you have. In fact, that's uh, that is exactly what I wrote last time. <laughs> okay, and actually, it looks like. Although it looks like Chuck, like we reworded it somewhat. Hold on. So here was the. Oh no, that that was about something else. Never mind. Yeah. No, that that is that is it. Okay. So, um, would you like to massage sure. that into into a motion? Yeah. So, um, it, 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 you see what I put in there, brief uh, as as uh, before there. Whereas contracts have been executed for conducting poll inventory services with the Apex Group, Eustace Cable Enterprises, and Tilson Technology Management, whereas the board has approved phase one for the initial pre construction work, and whereas the executive committee recommends the board approve the issuance of a request for bids for the phase one poll inventory, uh, the recommendation from the um, uh, executive committee to the board is that the board authorize the issuance of a request for bids for poll inventory services for phase one. And that upon a review of the sub submitted proposals, the executive committee is authorized to enter into a contract or contracts that are in the best interest of CV fiber. That's okay. the motion. I will hear motion. motion. Do we have a second? I second it. Okay, yeah. seconded by David Healy. Any further discussion? So I will I will discuss this. This is our um this is our taking the next step. So we have entered into, um, we have signed, not contracts, what's what's the word that what we uh, just master signed? Master service master agreements. agreements. Thank you. We just signed master service agreements with these three vendors. So they are ready and willing to submit bids to us when we are ready to solicit them. So we, we will put out an our uh, request for bid or request for um, proposal from them and they will bid using the information that we present them. That's not, um, that's all gonna, you know, us awarding the bid is obviously going to be contingent on, on another step, which is the funding. Um, once we have the funding, then we can essentially tell them go and we're ready to, and we're ready to proceed with, with the first step of phase one. Siobhan. Um, yeah, I was confused by the word contracts because I thought, well, if we have contracts, why do we need bids? It confused me a little bit there, but that was clear. Thank you. Um, maybe I should have added this as a agenda item, but my conversation, I, I emailed you and David about my conversation with the select board yesterday. Hmm. Um, and so if we want to ask for money, we have to ask for, I need specific information to give them so that we can do that in relation to this poll inventory specifically. That's why I bring it up right now. Right, I will, uh, uh, so I, I, I haven't answered that yet. That's that's on my list of things to do, but yes, there is a specific ask um, for um, for select boards to come in and essentially be involved in one part of what, one of the phases, depending on where you are. So there is some um, timing sensitivity. We don't, we essentially don't necessarily want everybody um, writing us checks right right this second because we're not really ready to build in absolutely every town. I mean, if the Berlin Select Board came to me and said, you know, here, we've got some money for you, like, well, just not, we're not, not quite ready to to say what we're doing with it yet, but we'll get there. But yeah, I will uh, I will follow up with you, Siobhan, and we'll, we'll talk about specifically what that looks like. Um, okay, anything else on this? This is our, again, this is our, <clears throat> one baby step foot in front of the next in order to eventually see, you know, 
construction maybe by the end of the year if everything moves smoothly and funding funding flies. Yeah, Alan? I I had a question pop into my mind when I was <laughs> actually bicycling the other day looking at po poles as I go along. That's my new thing to do when I bike. I look at poles. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's, what's going to be the relationship between pole surveys we do and pole surveys that Washington Electric might do? Is that to be coordinated? Yeah, so so they, they have no reason to duplicate efforts with us. So we will, I mean, I expect it, David, you could probably talk more intelligently about this. This will be in the MOU about uh, sharing of data and kind of project planning. Yeah. So Alan, if, if we're doing this now just to keep things moving, um, but basically when Washington Electric starts moving on its dark fiber build, they will be responsible for the poll inventory and poll make ready. So this is just so we can get going this year. Um, because they will not be able to do anything until they have the money sometime October, November. And so this way it's, we will be submitting from this poll inventory a make ready request for 3000 polls in the, in the phase one route. Um, so we want to give them advance notice on that. And then in the future, I mean, it basically it's going to take them a while to do the make readies. And so the long, they, the the quicker they have the information the better we can move forward too so that's sort of the plan so it's sort of we we take we we take the first step of having the poll inventories done and then they take the second step of handling the make ready correct well we're, and then, yeah and then, and then the third step is whoever hangs the fiber is hanging the correct. fiber correct okay now in, in the phase one route there are also 300 Green Mountain power poles, which is pretty small, but that, there are that many, um, and they will be the make ready request for those that, because Green Mountain Power's database has all the information needed to do a make ready request. Um, we will do deal with them separately. I mean, they don't need to be inventoried. <clears throat> hmm. uh, That's good. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Appreciate that. So, 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 David, it's just a matter of essentially telling them which polls we're talking about on the map, and that they they just pull it and they're ready to go. No, we have to actually file applications, two hundred polls at a time. So, Green Mountain Power will get two applications. Okay. And they will review that and get back to us when they need a. And then after you do that, there's a write out to all the polls. <laughs> and uh, so it's a it's a series of steps to get to the to get to go. Cool. All right. Any other questions about the uh, the poll auditing step? Yeah, Phil. Yes. Um, th since there was a question on what contracts meant, um, it meant apparently it means um, master service agreements. Should we just use that phrase just to be a little more precise in the um, in the motion? So um, the master service agreements have already been were already approved were already approved by the executive committee. It was already, that was authority that was previously delegated. I think these contracts are, um, once we're ready to go out to bid, um, we are gonna send out the, the request for bid, they will bid, and then we will enter into the contracts when, we're, when we have money to do so. We're essentially delegating that authority to the executive committee. Oh, right, and the, but in the, but this motion in the first sentence says, whereas contracts have been executed. And what that means, what was meant, I believe, is master service uh, agreements have been executed. Right, yeah, so if you change those contracts, if you say, whereas master service agreements have been executed, yes, that would be. A little more precise right. since there's already been question about it. So. Yep, that's that's perfectly good. I'll accept that as a friendly amendment. Yeah, me right. too. Okay. Okay. Any other um, any other comments about about this? Any thoughts? Okay. So, if you're ready to vote, I will ask if there are any objections. Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Thanks for that. Um, let's go on to the bills. So, um, we have a bill for the bookkeeper for three hundred and four dollars. Um, Chuck, could you remind me the uh, the amount uh, for the PM search? 
you were asking. So straight 500. And the CVRPC bill was? I, uh, I don't know. $906.25. Nine hundred and six dollars and twenty five cents. Um, and one of the reasons that that was higher, I think, than um, than it, it was higher because Christian really got tossed into uh, the deep end <laughs> with our meeting uh, a month ago. So um, but my expectation is that, you know, as Christian and and Zach get more comfortable with doing the minutes that they'll be able to produce them quicker and uh, hopefully that time will come will come down. Okay. So yeah, RD. Um I did not notice that the uh, <clears throat> the invoice was either am I exactly the services C D R P C performed for us. Uh, if you scroll down uh, it, it's only two line items. It's I think eight and a quarter hours for Christian, and uh, I don't remember exact. It's like four and a half or something yeah. like that for Zach, uh, but it is itemized. Right. Was that all minutes? Correct. Yes. It was for, like eleven uh, hours for, to produce minutes uh, for two meetings. Was that the for how many meetings? Two meetings. So I'm not sure if it's if it's my it connection. Seems excessive. Oh. Okay. And do do we have a sense, Jeremy, of, so of what like, the? Uh... Like, well, so Zach's were kind of on par with how long it usually takes me about. You know, I think the meeting was a couple hours and it took him another two hours beyond that to clean up the minutes and get them sent out. Um, that's on par with with what, you know, with, with with how long it usually takes me to produce these minutes. Um, Christian, I think, was eight and a half hours. That meeting, though, was, I think, like three or three and a half hours long. It was a long one. It was complex. There was a lot of discussion. And um, my sense is that Christian is maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Christian, but um, that maybe isn't uh, entirely up to snuff on exactly what is important and what is not, um, mm -hmm. and what can be ignored and what is not. So his, his minutes were very, very detailed, which is good. Uh, but I think that going forward, he'll get a better sense of, oh, okay, this is how I can kind of condense this multiple, you know, these multiple, you know, multiple people speaking into a, you know, in, into a few sentences of, you know, discussion ensued about this because the details of the discussion aren't really that important. Um, and I, I've talked to him a little bit about that. So, yeah, I'd just like to jump in and say, um, I'm going to also review that because that does seem excessive even from the billing side of it. I don't recall it being that high. I think there might have been another item in there that didn't show up in the invoice um explaining that time so um it, one it definitely should speed up i okay. agree that jeremy second i'm gonna double check that i know yeah okay, okay. so yeah so i mean it, it doesn't itemize what you spent your time on christian it just says you spent eight and a half hours um i was not aware of you spending time on other things so maybe going forward if we have a, a, a list of tasks that you worked on, that would be helpful. So, so, so let's look at this, let's look at the next invoice that we get and then, and if we can get a sense of, is this something that we want to continue doing? Um, if it, if it ends up continuing to be expensive, then we may just choose to, um, figure something else out. Yeah. It, it looks like the hourly rate is $82 an hour. If it's 11 hours and nine hundred and six dollars twenty five cents, I know that includes overhead. Um, but. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I see. I see thirteen hours, but so thirteen hours. So that'll. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and they actually have the hourly rate for um, for each of them. 
anyways. All right, so I will move that we um, approve the bills in the amount totaling 1,000. Yeah? Uh, just one more note. I have an, I have a, uh, a document that's uh, titled CB Fiber Governing Board Draft Meeting Minutes, March 25th, but it's clearly the executive committee. Okay. That um, 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 I may have those minutes out, which were three pages long, were misidentified. Okay, sure, I will have to that? fix that for the. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so what you're saying is the document name was governing board minutes, but the content was executive committee. Yes, it was the executive. It was the minutes of the executive committee meeting, not the governing board. Okay, just a, sounds just, good. Just I, I do copy the files to use them as templates, so. Um, I will go correct that in the executive committee minutes. Thanks, R.D. Appreciate the uh, attention to detail. Okay. I'm going to move that we approve the three bills in the total amount of $1,710.25. Second. Okay. Seconded by Siobhan. Any further discussion? Yes, please. This is Jerry. I, yeah. I just want to make sure that we get into the minutes that this uh, – Bookkeeper invo invoice is for MBM Associates, and it's invoice number 2183. Number 2183. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? Uh, I can provide just quick clarification on the ad spend if people sure. want. Yeah, that'd be good. Okay. Um, so the, the governing board had pre-approved the idea of spending uh, up to $2,500 for the purpose of advertising the open PM uh, position and or RFP. Uh, and uh, we did a fair amount of experimentation on advertising. It ran into some um, firewalls that didn't let us do it via Facebook, but we did do some advertising via LinkedIn. Uh, and that is where that $500 went. Uh, however, the LinkedIn advertisement, I don't know that it was particularly successful in driving any actual proposals for us. Uh, so we went ahead and turned it off so that we wouldn't end up spending the full 2500 All right. Any questions for Chuck about that? Okay. So um, any objections to approving these bills? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Thank you for that. Let's go on to the clerk update. Jeremy? Yeah, so um, one of the items was that we did receive the CVRPC invo uh, invoice. Um, the other is just a reminder to people that I believe we need letters of reappointment from your towns. Um, so, you know, if you're going to continue being the delegate, alternate, et cetera, uh, towns need to send us letters um, saying who is appointed to what position. Um, and I'll send out an email to the board reminding them of that. And thanks, Chuck, for the reminder. <laughs> um, the next item is that I've gone through the back minutes, the ones that were missing. Oh, Tom has a question. Go ahead. Um, just because we don't have purview into seeing what necessarily a select board sent in. Can you provide some sort of, you know, checklist of who's okay and who needs to get that sent in? According to the statutes, it only... needs to be done annually. Um, and I will send the language in the chat so that you can review it yourself because it, it, it describes exactly what needs to happen. It wasn't a question of whether it needs to happen. Okay. It was what, whether it already has happened and I just don't know about it or not. Uh, as, <laughs> the only one that I've got, I believe, is... Go Sorry, go ahead, Jeremy. The only one that I've seen is Moortown. Um, so if I'm missing any, um, I'll double check that. But at this point, it's all the rest of us, all the rest except for Chuck. So uh, we, we've also gotten one from uh, for Washington. So oh, yeah, okay. we're, we're we're good for right. Washington. Right. Um, yes. uh, let's see who else. I want to say uh, Barry City, we're we're good for as well. I'm, or, I'm sorry, not Barry City, Barry Town. Barry Town is good. Okay. I don't think we've seen so any. I thought they had to be 
re-upped every year. They do, and the statute has a little um, a little item in there that if there's no explicit kind of re-upping, that uh, whoever was last appointed remains, which is why we have some people still officially on the books that probably shouldn't be, because we have select boards and, and people not not being terribly active or proactive about it. Yeah, RD. Are you suggesting then, Jeremy, that all of us um, and ask for letters of should uh, return to our municipal board reappointment? Uh, yeah, that would be um, that. That would be is helpful. Th is that the default procedure? Um, I have in the past um, sent out an email in after town meeting day. Um, somebody else sent it out one year. Um, I'm not really sure who sent it out in the past. It was maybe a former clerk. Um, but yeah, we have sent those. We have sent those out from either me or a clerk has done that. And then sometimes I just get them from the select boards or city councils by default. And I, um, I guess there's there's enough turnover in select boards that they're not um, they're not all being proactive about it. Yeah, Ray. Don't we have a mailing list of all the town managers? Uh, and if we don't, perhaps we should. And why don't we send an email to them um, uh, referencing the statute and asking for the appointments uh, letters? I would be happy to have somebody do that. I do not have a list of town managers. And as a matter of fact, probably half of our towns don't have town managers. Um, I've been sending these not notices in the past to town clerks um, right. and ha having the town clerks uh, essentially escalate it from there. I'm happy to, to, pass, to pass that along that way as well. Um, but I hear remarkably little from town clerks, frankly, even, even, even though they see all of our, all of our announcements. Yeah, we... I mean, the chair of the select board is usually, I mean, I got a letter, an email from my chair of the select board saying, David, do you want to get reappointed last month? So I think it's the chair of the select board that pays more attention than this than the clerks for some reason. And what she does, she sends it out to every every organization that has appointed members. I mean, what, the CV5 wasn't the only one. So yeah. so maybe this is a good opportunity, uh, Christian and CVRPC, if we can, because I, I know Bonnie has a list of all of the town managers or the um, select board chairs. And I think she she's done, or maybe she hasn't herself, but folks at CVRPC have sent out blasts like this. Maybe we could just send a message out to the, the 20 towns, or at least the towns that are within CVRPC's umbrella, and then we can pick up the the remainder. That, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, all right, Any anything else? Um, anything else? Yeah, about so I was still talking about the, oh, I'm sorry, go on. No, I'm still talking about the minutes, though. So before we move off this, yeah, but. go for it. Okay, um, so um, in terms of the minutes, I've gone through all the ones that I can find. Uh, the ones that I found approvals for, I went through, cleaned them up, put them on letterhead. Um, if there were any notes saying that you know approved with spelling corrections, I went in and did spell check and, you know, corrected spellings where I could. Um, and those are those approved minutes are all posted to the website. Um, there are a number of minutes that were never approved. Um, that looks like the July 9th, December 17th and February 2nd minutes were never approved. Um, I have attached those, and you know, if someone wants to make a motion to approve those, that could be something that could be done. Um, there is um, the minutes of the August. Uh, let's see, uh, sorry, I should organize this a little bit better here. Um, so, in in terms of the minutes that we didn't have draft minutes for, that's. Uh, August 13th, September 10th, October 8th, and October 22nd. Those um, 
of those, I've listened to the recordings for three of the minutes and generated minutes from those recordings as best I could. Um, the uh, see, there's one that is completely missing entirely, um, and I don't have that right in front of me. I think it's the September 10th meeting. Um, and I guess that's sort of an open question of what do we do with that meeting? Do we leave a blank hole on the website with no minutes? Do we post a document saying, you know, due to technical difficulties, the September 10th minutes were lost and we have no record of this meeting? I guess that's kind of a approach that I would go because one, there's not a, um, it's, there's not an obvious hole on the website and it explains upfront what happened um, to those minutes. So that's where we are with the governing board minutes. Yeah, well, why don't you just put a placeholder in there to that effect? Um, and I think the, if it was recent minutes, like within the last couple of months, yeah, maybe we can, we can approve them. Um, if you send those back out, we can put them on the next agenda. So I will put back minutes on, on the next agenda. Um, so I, I sent those out on March 25th oh. with all of the draft minutes attached. Okay. So I'm, I, am, I have not reviewed those for this meeting. I would like to sit on those a, a bit and come back, come back at the next meeting and do that if we could. Um, I should point out though that there's absolutely nothing obliging us to approve minutes. I mean, that's that's a it's a formality. Okay. It's a good thing to do so that everybody knows that the the official record was correct. Um, and, and we do find things every now and then, but <clears throat> at least our statutory obligation to keep minutes does not require us to approve them technically. Sure. So I can either put them up as draft. We can say, well. We're going to accept these as the official record. Um, Just post them as yeah, post them as a draft, and any of the, the more recent ones that then we'll will actually approve at the at the next meeting. Then. Okay, I think none of them are particularly recent. Okay, yeah, it, this honestly, this is fairly pro forma. I'm not sure that we need to really spend any more time on it. I really appreciate you having gone back and produced them. Um, I'm not sure that we necessarily need to go to that next step. Uh, Alan, I see you have your okay. hand up. Yeah, uh, Jeremy, when you've been referencing minutes in the last uh, five minutes, five minutes of discussion, you meant minutes of the governing board. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Because I if I recall, there are a yeah. lot of committee meeting minutes that are also uh, not 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 there. I, I've I've gone ahead. And I've created minutes for the missing policy committee meetings, but I think I, I, I've hesitated to bring this up because I don't know if anybody knows the answer to this, but I think I've got to run those minutes by the former chair, Phil, to just have a general sense of whether I'm, I'm on, I'm going in the right direction with what I have. I was at almost all the meetings, so I have some notes myself, and I can tell from other actions that were taken what happened. And then once I have Phil say, yeah, these look okay, I was going to try and get as many of the people who were present for the meetings to um, join the policy committee at its next meeting when we can have one and look at those minutes and make sure that there's nothing in error. Does Does that sound like that's what you want us to do that you want us to try and clean up the committee meeting minutes as well is that correct when you say you do you mean me or jeremy hansen or no me i i'm you know i'm trying to clean up oh. the minute well, do i want what should we be doing generally i mean technically you're the clerk so you could i guess you could tell us <laughs> you could tell us to forget it it's a pain <laughs> in the neck nobody mm -hmm. reads them anyhow I don't think we ought to be doing that. I, I think we should be trying to reconstruct as many of them as we, as we possibly can, and at least make a good intent to be doing what the law requires us to do. You know, my gut feeling is that trying that we're not going to be able to do that for the governing board. You know, we're not going to be able to go back and say like, 
hey, all you people who are here at this meeting, show up and discuss these for, you know, I and know. frankly, I don't remember, you know, month to month necessarily what happened at all these meetings. You know, expecting people to remember back two years. What I think might make sense is to just, for any of these notes that you've created, and, and correct me if someone has a better idea, but, you know, say that, you know, these are based on, you know, produced on and put the date that you produced them or the approximate date, you know, based, you know, reconstructed based on notes from Alan Gilbert, you know, in consultation with Phil Hayek, if Phil's willing to sit down with you and go over those. Okay, um, well, let me... That, that would be my recommendation, but okay. if, if someone has a better suggestion. But why don't we just chew on this and, and uh, meanwhile, I'll try and... Okay round things up and get people to look at them um and so i'm i'm pretty sure i've got most of the stuff correct but it would help to have a few more eyes look at them okay sounds good okay. anything else on this jeremy uh no that's also it sounds like we're gonna wait and chew on them uh and or i'm just gonna or, okay so i guess that's a question are we gonna wait and chew on them or am I going to post them as draft, and we're just going to move on from here? So, how how old is the most recent one that you're talking about? Is it last year? Uh, the most recent ones is just flipping through real quick. The most recent one is February 11th, 2020. No, just mark them as draft. Put them yeah, on the website, no... and let and let's get just let's get past this. Okay. I, I think that. It's not uh, the juice isn't worth the squeeze on this one. Um, there's not going to be enough substantial changes to justify the extra work and the extra board time to to go at to go after this if we need to, because there's some um, some pressing issue that refers back to one of these. Then then yeah, then let's go back. I think we're what we'll do is we'll just say we're we're doing much better now. We have a much better process. Um, we have you know folks diligently taking notes and things are working better now, so. Okay, sounds good, thanks. And thank you for that's all of all the work have. going back and doing the uh, the research and watching those meetings. That's uh, that's that's a lot of work. That's not not work that I that I envy at all. One of them was well over three hours long. Oh, <laughs> oh my, yeah. That's a that's that's a hard pass for me. Okay, so let's let's go on to uh, funding for the ongoing legal work. So we had approved. Um, how much did we approve? Two thousand dollars for the MOU with Washington Electric. Is we, that we approved a two thousand dollar retainer with right. the idea that that was going to go towards the MOU with WEC. Okay, so which has uh, been paid, by the way. Great. So. Who would like to give us some context of where 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 we are now and where we're likely to go? Because that two thousand dollars, poof, that was that was fast, and we're well beyond it now. So, well, I'll I'll take a whack at it with Ray to support. Um, so we have been working with Washington Electric's lawyer. We have been working with um, NEK Broadband, who's using the same lawyer we are. So we're sharing costs with them. And we're working with EC Fiber's lawyer and Washington Electric's lawyer. So there's a lot of lawyers who are eating up hours to develop this MOU. This MOU is very comprehensive and, in my opinion, is as close to whatever we would end up with a contractual agreement in the next few months. But in the meantime, the MOU spells out all the relationships and all the plan, all the um, the, the how things will work and who leases what to whom, how we deal with our off terriers. Um, it's, it, it covers, I think the committee is, which is Ken, um, Roy, Ray, Ray, Jerry, and myself. And we've been meeting, well, we've slowed, we've slowed down our meetings, thank God, but it was getting, it was getting quite, quite intense and, we think we've come to a pretty good agreement with Washington Electric. We have a separate agreement that we're working with on any uh, with uh, Kingdom Fiber, who is part of the uh, the partnership with WEC, and has Adolf areas in 
CV fiber territory. So that one's still underway. We're waiting to hear back from Michael's on that probably in the next day or two, which will probably require a little bit more work. So in the meantime, we've 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 racked up a bill. We have an outstanding invoice for the month of March of thirty six hundred and fifty dollars. And I've forgotten, she's estimated what it would take, what her expenses might be in April, but I have forgotten those and Ray may remember what her estimate was. No. Anyway, we're still still employing her at uh, a rate of $200 an hour. Um, she is incredibly competent, knowledgeable, and has really looked out for our butt. So that's all I can say about it. It's not cheap. So, um Jerry, did you have a chance to, to review the uh, the grant materials? And does this look like we have uh, some wiggle room within that to uh, to cover these costs? We do have some wiggle room in that. Certainly, the uh, the grant from the Public Service Department uh, itemizes six thousand dollars for legal fees, and that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be other monies from other um, awards that we've gotten previously that may not have been fully allocated and can be used to cover uh, whatever remainder of the legal fees there are. Um, it's, this, this is critically important stuff. We have to figure out how to pay this. So the, um, the $6,000 that's specifically itemized in the, in the uh, grant, there, there may also be opportunities I don't know if there are or not, but there may be opportunities to rob from Peter and to pay Paul so that we can move some money around within that grant within those same categories. I, I would expect that that would probably be okay. Um, so uh, yeah, I think we can, I think we can uh, move forward with her. And I, I, I can't overemphasize the importance of the assistance that we've been getting here. This is, this is critical help for us. And something I want to point out too is because this is part of a concrete project. This is part of our phase one project that I think that this will be packaged in as we're kind of building the budget, as we're building in the kind of the, the flow for how we're spending funds. This is this is part of phase one. Um, so it's not poll make ready. It's not poll auditing. It's not construction, but it is, um, you know, folks have, you know, Jeremy posted in the chat, this is, this is just as important as that, probably more important because it's, I think it sets the expectations. So. Um, this is a part of pre-construction engineering. This is, this is a standard part of the, the effort that needs to be done pre-construction. So that this, this falls well within that, you know, area. Right. Ray, would you talk about what you just posted in the chat? Cause I think that's, that's worthwhile. Muted. I'm rarely muted, uh, but okay. Um, I have a motion to move the board approve the March legal invoice for WEC MOU for $3,650 and the board uh, approve the continued engagement with Krista Shu to complete the work, understanding that the cost will be shared with NEK and EC Fiber CUDs. Um, and I think David has given a great deal of background and, and Jerry has as well. Um, um, she's just critical to the successful negotiation of an agreement. She's so knowledgeable as well as being a, a lawyer, but knowledgeable about the business and that we will so, wind up with a good, a good document at the end protecting us. Okay, so I saw RD with a second. Uh, any, any further discussion about that? Do you, um, so the other thing that you mentioned about the cost sharing formula, do you wanna just mention that briefly? Yeah, so the um, we, uh, the CUDs are meeting independently um, amongst themselves because we have to organize, uh, uh, et cetera. And we have agreed amongst ourselves, and we're, it'll be reduced to writing, that we'll do a cost-sharing formula. And the formula is based upon the amount of WEC miles that will be developed in each of our CUDs. And uh, we have something like, I think David's estimate, is something like 60%. So we're not getting we're not getting out of it cheaply. On the other hand, we're the ones the main beneficiaries of all this. Any other thoughts or questions about about this? So just to be clear, we, our our um, net obligation is sixty percent of the thirty six fifty. 
No, the, that is that is our obligation for March. That's our, uh, that's our, it, our job. Right, and and on top of which, uh, we are getting we're now getting regular uh, timesheets or um, uh, documentation with regard as we go, so that there's no surprise, um, it, it, you know, along the way. Uh, so we're we're more or less more on top of the situation than than uh, let's say we were in March. So, uh, Jeremy, you want to verbalize your comment in the chat? I think that's a valuable question. Yeah, sure. So I, I just wanted to clarify that the cost sharing is not for the legal work. We're paying the legal work to produce the MOUs. The cost sharing uh, is that for the engineering and make ready um, across the entire WEX network. Here we're just talking about the cost sharing for the legal burden. Oh, it is. Okay. I didn't catch that part. The legal part. Well, we will have other cost sharing as we move forward. Uh, but right now we're just dealing with the legal bit. Okay, how's everybody feeling about that? Do we have an outside um, estimate on what the um, total legal costs might be uh, related to Prigs MOU? 10,000, 15,000? Um, my, my recollection is that she gave us uh, an idea of, like, say, the total hours that might be involved, but you know, it's all a, it's all a swag, right? Right. So all I wouldn't. A, Oh, sorry, Ray. Go ahead. No, Jerry, please. Well, I've I, I've I've got a uh, an administrative budget for the for the calendar year, and you know I've I've got eighteen thousand for the calendar year for legal fees as something to take us through December. Um, based on what we spent so far, of course it'll it'll you know, May is going to be a busy is going to be uh, a busy month. April and May are going to be busy as we finalize agreement. And then there's bound to be additional later on in the year. So that's, uh, that, that's, that's what I'm using as a working number, 18,000. Do you have, but do you have a sense of the order of magnitude for the, for getting to pass the MOU process? I mean, is it, a, is it another, uh, is another 5k? Do you, I mean, do you have a sense of it at least? I'm, so the, the there's there's the MOU which is pretty much close to being done with WEC. Then there are MOUs with the other the the other uh, uh, CUDs, and then there's also the uh, you know an MOU with the RDOF winners, and then we have the actual agreement with WEC that needs to get nailed down. So there there's there's a a, a number of parts. Uh, but they're all foundational parts, and that's why I I came up with the eight, eighteen thousand throughout the course of the year just to make sure that we have that money set aside uh, for this for the for this effort. Okay, I don't so, see and, cutting corners here. No, of course not. The um, um, the thing I wanted to mention that, that David said earlier, though, is that the MOU, as it stands right now, is not far away from where we're going to see the final contract. Um, so when we're ready to um, actually move forward and sign a formal contra contractual relationship with, uh, with WEC, then we'll, we probably won't have to do too much more beyond the MOU. That's the hope. And the intention, but that is not written in stone nor guaranteed, and we 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 need to have contingency for that not to happen. Sure. Yeah. There's there's that what saying about paving roads with good intentions, etc. <laughs> how about the, how about the saying the devils of the details? And and so I think what the MOU is we have a lot of detail. We have a lot of contract headings. Okay, <laughs> which leave uh, and the and the parties will work together in 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 uh, deciding what this means. Okay, so uh, we have the we have a good outline um, and an understanding of the, the positions of the parties, uh, but putting that in the contract language and getting the details ironed out uh, is still a bit of work to do. But um, it's a good MOU. And Tom, to answer your question, uh, partially answer your question, I, I, I do have $2,000 I specifically identified for 
contract reviews for contractors and the PM, specifically set aside in that 18,000 that I mentioned. Okay, any other discussion about the uh, $3,650 to get uh, Krista up to date and then essentially engaging her to, to finish? Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands uh, or any further discussion. If you're ready to vote, are there any objections to approving this? Seeing none, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you for that. Um, all right, let's move on. So funding for ongoing legal work, we're done with that. Let's do the um, um, well, committee appointments should be pretty quick. This is really here for one purpose. And uh, I would like to appoint um, uh, Alan Gilbert as the chair of the policy committee to fill, uh, fill in for uh, Phil Hayek, who has stepped down. Second. Okay, seconded by Chuck. Alan, I'm, I'm assuming that this is uh, still good for you? Yeah, I'm happy to do this. Okay, thank you very much. Any further discussion? Yeah, Ray? So my question is this, um, there seemed to have been some confusion in the past, in my view, about whether the committees themselves elected their chair or the board appointed the chairs. This is yeah. the discussion that's actually next on the agenda. No, um, and but, but having having now taken the step of the board approving the uh, someone appointed as chair, yeah, you've kind of, uh, you know, cleared the field for that as being the modus operandi. But the our, we have a full reorg happening in a month. So whatever we decide right now is going to start over in a month anyways. So, but Alan wants to try to get this policy committee um, moving forward in and the I short term. Alan, and I want Alan to do it. <laughs> okay. So, 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 so let's all vote yes on this and continue this conversation in a second. Okay, Any, anything else on appointing Alan to chair the policy committee? Wonderful, any objections? Hearing none, it passes unanimously. Thank you very much, everybody, and thanks, Alan, for shouldering that burden. Um, welcome welcome to the executive committee, Alan. Congratulations. Yes, yes, I realized that that was part of the deal. <laughs> can, can you add him, add him to the group, Chuck? Thank you. All right. Um, Next thing up is a board reorg in May and committee chairs. So um, at our next regularly scheduled meeting in May, so we have May 11th is when we will be appointing uh, or we'll be electing chairs, vice chairs, um, clerks, treasurers, and such. The other thing that we should do and should be doing is making sure that the committees are are appointed and updated as necessary. And Ray brought up the question of, um, does the governing board appoint the chairs of committees or do the committees themselves elect their chairs? Um, we've done, we've historically had this board appoint the chairs with the exception of most recently the finance committee and the finance committee elected its own chair. Does anybody have any, any feeling one way or the other about how we should do this. I, I guess what I would ask is, uh, David and Chuck, were you appointed or were you elected? Or do you remember? I do not remember. Uh, David, I can tell you, you were... that for communications, uh, I was elected in the uh, first communications committee meeting. Um, and so we did deviate from that, that pattern. Um, I'm sure the board, probably assumed it was going to go that way, given that I, I sort of pushed for the communications committee. And, you know, when you raise your hand, you're, you're signing up. This is Jerry. I was, I was appointed at the, as the chair of the planning committee way, way back when. And with my schedule of not being able to maintain uh, attendance at meetings, David took over and has been doing a much far better job than I ever could. <laughs> 
the, the point I'm making is that I frankly don't care whether the committee is elected chair or the board appoints it, but we just need to make sure we have a policy about how that goes down. Yeah, Chuck. Um, I, for one of the opinion of let it, let it be to the committees um, to self-organize. Uh, we have a lot to do and these meetings already run long. Uh, I don't necessarily think we need to be worried about that at the broader board level, um, unless some issue arise, at which point maybe we reserve the right to remove somebody if they're not uh, doing a, a good job and, and the committee is not stepping in to take action. Okay, Siobhan? That's kind of what I was going to say. Um, it, so, yeah, I, I, I'm with Chuck on that. Okay. So, Alan? I, Ray, Ray and I have had, have had some uh, uh, back and forths on this. We've sort of been arguing it. I, I'm, I'm of the opinion, not that it should be the chair or, uh, I'm sorry, not that it should be the the governing board chair who appoints the chairs, nor should it be the committee, but I think it ought to be some hybrid in between. And I think actually that's what what we were doing originally without really thinking about it. You know, we, something would come up at a meeting in the first year and before you, kn before you knew it, somebody said, you know, we really need to have a business committee. And we talk about that for a little bit and usually there'd be one person who was especially um, who especially was what was endorsing the idea and had obviously thought about why it was important and was making the case for it. And I think at that point, Jeremy Hansen, you would you would often say, it sounds like we ought to have a planning committee. And David Healy, it looks like you think this is important. You've thought about it. Would you mind serving as chair? <laughs> and I, I, I think that's how you got to be chair. I mean, it was it, it just became obvious. And I don't think anybody felt a need to vote on it. It was more an endorsement of the board chair as well as the members of the governing board generally. I think in some other committees, the committees have started meeting before there's been that kind of a discussion and, and a chair has emerged from that. But it, it, it seems to me in all cases, however the person becomes chair should at some point be recognized by the chair of the governing board. And if appropriate, we, maybe we can say we would want to make it necessary, there be endorsement by the entire board uh, of the chair who has been chosen either by the committee itself or by the governing board. I don't think we, I, I think it's a bad practice to have a committee that's, whose, whose governance itself is not evident to everybody else in the board. I guess that's what I'm getting at. Right. I would just note two things. One is that you may recall that the executive committee is made up of the uh, committee chairs. Okay, number one. Secondly, um, there there is a CB Fiber governing board rules of procedure, and I'm sure Alan can put his hands right on that. And I and I have it up on my screen here, and it makes no mention at all about the committees. None. I mean, who it mentions the chair, the vice chair, and other kinds of things, and forums and kind of the bylaws of, of our group, but doesn't mention the committees at all or how the chairs are appointed for the committees. Just a note. Well, it sounds like that's one thing that we should that we should work on. I think Jeremy Hansen, was it you who 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 drafted those rules of procedure? I, I can't remember how they if they came down, you know, in a chariot from heaven or or you 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 wrote them or did we get them from another did we get them from EC Fiber maybe? They, they, they came from a, an esteemed municipal attorney we used to have on our board in, in cooperation with the rest of the board. So John, John wrote those and took a lot of the stuff from the League of Cities and Towns and some of the other things that we had discussed. So um, yeah, these are, um, yeah, we agreed to them and then kind of re-agreed to them in subsequent years and we'll agree it probably I'll bring them back <clears throat> at the next meeting and we'll hopefully all agree to them again. Yeah. Well, it sounds like we should do something about addressing the chair issue. So um, 
maybe we can maybe we can think about that before we reapprove them again. How, you, you've been having us do that, if I remember, in June or something. Has it been in a summer meeting or? Yeah. So so I we can do it at the next meeting after we you know do the chair, vice chair, treasurer, clerk elections. We can do it right after that, just so that we um, we, we are approving it again. I mean. If we're gonna, we if we want to change it, I mean, there's nothing that stops us from changing it at any given at any given moment. So, so you uh, think though, Jim, the Jim Barlow was the guy who Jim, um, right? Yeah. yeah, Jim Barlow was the guy who wrote those. Yeah, that's that that's ringing a bell with me too. Yeah. So Tom, and I think Ray. they're actually, I, I think they're actually fairly good, and they are consistent with the statutes that we operate under. But there are some things that we probably should be adding. Ray's pointed one out, and we just haven't done it. Okay, Tom, then Ray. Um, so I guess the question of whether or not there needs to be some level of oversight over committee chairs, are they taking on roles or actions that um, require some level of oversight? And if that were to go to, uh, I assume like to the governing board, somebody would raise a, an alarm and say, hey, you need to pay attention to this and have this person removed from the chair. Would there be then some sort of duration to that or, or term? How would it be executed? It seems like, at that point, then it sits with the the governing board to say, okay, now we're going to make the new chair this, and um, for some point in the future, they can. Uh, I, I guess I, I'm I'm of the opinion, a little bit more of an kind of an anarchist perspective. Like we can delegate this, we can be a bit decentralized, and I'm I'm going to trust the folks that are on this board that they're going to do the right thing. And if 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 something really really <clears throat> awful awful happens somebody's going to hear about it and we'll be able to yeah. move. I don't know that we need to have like a formal duration or specific oversight or anything like this. I'm, I'm um, not trying to cast shadows on anyone here. I, I fully agree. I'm thinking more um, headlines three or four years ago of, of people misappropriating funds or, or that kind of thing that we would want to set up a precedent so that we're not, you know, because we didn't think about it early, leaving ourselves in a bad place later on. Yeah, I hear you. Ray, you want to have the last word, and then we can hopefully move on. Yeah. So uh, my recommendation is, why don't we refer to this to the policy committee? Sounds great, Alan. I got you it. You have, you have okay. it. Thank you. <laughs> Moving along. Um, I, I neglected to do this earlier, but I wanted to uh, welcome uh, Roger Nishi. Welcome, Roger. I see you down there. Roger's from Waitsfield Champlain Valley Telecom, and uh, happy to have you chime in on any of this stuff, or if you have any specific stuff um, that you'd like to talk about, I'm happy to uh, let you um, weigh in whenever you like, if, if you choose to. Cool. Okay. Um, let's go on to the PM search. Can we uh, get an update on the, the PM search and what that looks like? I wanted to make a comment about that. I didn't have an update, but go ahead, Ray. Uh -oh. Make an up, make your update first. <laughs> so I have an update now that David's left. So there's um, a group of David, myself, uh, Tom, and Jerry, who are on the uh, PM uh, review committee of the applications that are coming in. And thank you, Chuck. Uh, I think for all of the Indeed applications that we've been getting, we have 25, 30 of these things. Uh, and I understand that the date is April 26th is the last date. Can we make it today? Um, we, we have all of these things to review with the view that um, that uh, this group, the, the review group would make a recommendation, go sift through all of this stuff, just like we did for the, um, uh, the uh, polls uh, companies, for example, sift through all the stuff, make a recommendation to the PDC and the PDC then make a recommendation to the board. Uh, with regard to um, a higher. Uh, so the, the process is, I think that if the 26th is the last date, we're gonna need a couple of weeks to go through all of that process. So I'm thinking that the May meeting might be an appropriate meeting. So there'll be a couple of bits to that. One is I expect there'll be a recommendation. I hope there will. Uh, and secondly, uh, we'll have to come up with the money. Obviously we can't hire anyone. We didn't indicate in the RFP that I recall that uh, expectation was that the initial term would be six months uh, and then depending on funding uh, and also whether or not we, we liked the guy or gal uh, and the job they were doing um, and whether we actually had a project to manage, assuming we had money to move everything along. So um, I think that we're looking at the main meeting for possible board action. 
Okay. Jerry, did you have something else then? Yeah, so I want I want to add something to that. So um, I've decided to make a proposal myself. So I'm going to be submitting a proposal. So I need I cannot be on the selection committee. I don't think Alan will let me do that. So um, it would not I, be a good idea. Yes. It would not be a good idea. So well, anything to get out of doing the work. Yeah, right. <laughs> so some I. I I realize that there are quite a few, um, uh, at least from Indeed anyway, and I don't know if any of those are valid um, for, for a serious review, but the, uh, that leaves only three. So somebody really does need to take my place being that I'm going to uh, submit a proposal. Is there anybody in the meeting now that'd be willing to step into that review process? So, um, so I, see both, committee? I see both Jeremy and Tim raising their, their hands. I, Jeremy, I saw your hand first, so if you want to weigh in and then Tim. Um, I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I'm willing to do it if no one else wants to. It's, it's important that it gets done. I'm also pretty darn busy. So, um, you know, if Tim wants to take it and four is enough, I'm fine with that too. All right. That's, what do you think, Tim? That's up to you, Jeremy. If uh, you've got enough to do, I'm sure I'll, I'll be glad to help out and uh, review. Um, I've had a lot of experience hiring people over the years, so I know what to look for in uh, resumes, and I uh, do some pretty good detective work too. Okay, well, I don't have any experience hiring people, so uh, it sounds like you're more qualified than I am. <laughs> All right. Want one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he's he's got to graduate, right? I do need to graduate. <laughs> My wife keeps telling me this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chuck. Ray, do you want to keep the Indeed job post open for a little bit longer and see who trickles in, or you want me to go ahead and take that down? Um, I've only seen a few recently here, so I think it's kind of uh, I think. Thank God it's got, you know, uh, run, it's almost run its course, I think. So I don't think you need to take it down. Um, and uh, it, it, is it really up until the 26th? Is that what the, is that what the notices said? I, I don't recall off the top of my head. My recollection was the 15th, <laughs> but uh, if it's the 26th, it's the 26th. The 26th comes right out of the request for proposal. That's Damn. That's Okay. All right. So uh, re review folks from the PDC if you want to loop Tim in and get him um, get him up to speed if you can. That would be that'd be terrific. And Chuck, add him to the list and take Jerry off. Traitor. Slacker. <laughs> <laughs> Traitor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else about the the project manager search? I mean, so it sounds like we're we're going to have this on the agenda again for for May as well. Uh, Siobhan, just being annoying. Can I just please make sure that you're giving a real good review to the female presenting ones because they tend to be worded differently than the male presenting ones if they're individuals. Um, but really give a careful consideration of of what they're saying, their experiences, and what they've done, and 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 all of that, because it's a it's something we all do when we're reviewing these things. We tend to lean towards these certain ways of expressing things. So just really encouraging you to be open at what you're reading. I know it's a lot that you're having to get through, but please please do that. So, Judge. Siobhan, I'm going to go on a limb here. Would you be willing to help in reviewing those as well so that we can make sure that that extra check happens? I mean, not that you need anything else to do, but aren't you like arguably retired and, and such? <laughs> I'm retired. <laughs> I'm volunteering at the food bank and I'm working two days a week for my old office. Um, I... am willing to do so, but I I have concerns as is all. I, I just I feel um 
like I might be a drag on things. Okay, so so tell you what, what let's let's just chat tomorrow because we have some other stuff to chat about with you know regarding the select board and whatever. And if yeah. uh, and if you feel comfortable, you know maybe you just follow up with. Uh, so who who's actually spearheading? So Chuck, you're you're spearheading that, right? The the search. Who's who's spearheading the search? Well, it's the team of David, myself, now Tim and uh, Tom. Okay, so well. Siobhan will just reach out to you if she's still interested in doing that. I, I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. I just thought that, okay. that, have, that having your, your perspective um, would be would be valuable there as well. Thanks. Sure. All right, anything else on the PM search? Okay. Mm -hmm. Moving along, uh, board and committee calendar. Um, Ray put out a proposed um, committee calendar for what we would count our regularly scheduled meetings. So we know the governing board has a regularly scheduled meeting the second Tuesday of every month. And often we have a special meeting two weeks after that. Um, Ray's proposal was that essentially each committee would have a specific time a specific, or a specific day and week of the month. And uh, if you didn't need it, that's fine. You could just declare that there was no meeting, but so that we could set the expectation and the timing so that folks who are serving on those committees can more easily um, get a grip on their schedules. Um, so I think the email the email was sent out on March 29th, 2021. I can I can walk through the uh, I can walk through the proposal if that if that's helpful. Oh, so Ray's got it in the in the chat already. That's that will work. So uh, the calendar would kind of set a rhythm for the the uh, work of the of the um, organization, um, with providing uh, days set aside for special meetings on Tuesdays and Thursdays being the first week. The, um, the board and the exec committee meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays of the second week. Exec committee uh, would should follow the board meeting immediately because of the board actions that the exec committee may have to then implement. PDC um, drives a lot of the work that we're all involved with, whether you're the comms committee, the finance committee, or anything else. And so it would meet the following week, followed by comms, uh, and then the finance committee and policy as needed. Um, and that was the uh, recommendation from the policy committee and their charter, if you recall. Times would be set by the committees. Um, so the Tuesday and Thursday of the uh, week, week one is set aside for special meetings, but every Wednesday is also available. If anybody, if any committee felt like they needed a special meeting, uh, they could also meet on, on a Wednesday. Um, so uh, this, this, is, this would help us, I think, get organized and, and uh, get the rhythm of the organization and the workflow um, uh, better. Yeah, Alan? Ray, I, I I don't quite understand how your um, what the Tuesday and Thursday you just mentioned relate to. Are are you setting specific days of the week when specific committees meet, or do they choose to do that within the week that you've assigned them? No, actually, the specific days of the week. When you take a look at the email and also the sample calendars I sent out for May and June, um, yeah. it. Tuesday is the board, Thursday is the exec committee, the following Tuesday is the PDC, the following Thursday is comms, the following Tuesday is finance, the following Thursday is policy. So the committee dates are set uh, for the, those weeks of the month. And, and as far as the times go, um, 6, 6.30, 5.30, whenever the committees decide they want to meet. And what, what is the reason for having to set the day of the week of the committee? Couldn't the committee do that themselves based on their own availability? Um, I, I think it's, if you're looking, if you're looking ahead, you know, the uh -huh. fact that you kind of set something aside. Uh, in addition to that, if you look at uh, EC Fiber and any of the other, any of the other committees, for example, CUDs, you will see that they will have uh, the days of the, the month that they're meeting. They have a regularly set scheduled date. And uh, so this makes it easier for public notice, for example, uh, for when things are going to happen. It's, it, it's, it's interesting to have a grid like that. I, what I've always worried about with committees is sometimes 
it's difficult to find a time that works for everybody um, who's already serving on the board to, to devote another night to something else. And I, I just worry about the lack of flexibility of being able to determine alter, an alternative day. You know what? That'll always be the way forever and ever, amen. It, but at least knowing that the third Tuesday of the month is a PDC meeting, you can either have that, have that schedule on your thing and you're protected, or you can't. Tom? I tend to be with Alan on this. It, as an all-volunteer board, um, calendars are going to be set by what other people can make it happen and what they can't make happen. And if they are really good for one particular committee, but they just can't make that night work ever because they have a lock solid commitment, then I think we lose a valuable resource by setting it up to be that inflexible. Uh, RD and then Chuck. I want to move that we adopt Ray's uh, proposed schedule as a default template. Okay, there is a motion for uh, there's for meetings. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay, Siobhan got that second. Uh, Chuck, you want to add your feedback here? Yep. Yeah, I, I think um, a couple of things here. First of all, I really like the flow of information of this schedule. Uh, the second thing I'd like to point out is most of these committees already have a set day of the month um, generally speaking on uh, you know Tuesday of the fourth week of the month or something like that schedule uh, that they're following with special meetings in between on a, on a more ad hoc basis um, I do think by adopting the schedule we don't have to say this is this way or the highway uh, to RD's point, I really like the way you worded this, RD, so thank you. Uh, to RD's point, I think we can consider this the template, and if a particular committee finds that they are going to lose out on an important member of that committee every time that happens, then I think it should still be up to that committee to say, okay, well, uh, you know, for our committee, the, the, the third uh, Thursday of every month actually doesn't work out. Uh, we're going to make it the third Wednesday of every month and and just, you know, uh, populate that information back up to the board as as the new regular meeting date. Uh, but I think it's a great schedule, and I, I, I do think we should move towards this anyway. Any other thoughts about this? I'm, uh, yeah, Siobhan. I need to rethink my committee appointments. This <laughs> has me in meetings three weeks a month, and if, I don't if they like meet. it. I <laughs> mean, yeah. Well, yeah, but the board, the PDC, and the finance committee are going to meet every month. So that's every Tuesday, three Tuesdays out of the month. So I don't know. I may have to think about that. So I'm going to um, slightly reframe what, what RD said. Um, and so if we set what we call the regular meeting days, these are, there is a statutory impact of this for when the default is, when the default meeting day is. We, these meetings don't have to be set. These can be reset whenever. It just has, I mean, the committee can, can do this itself. It can set a different meeting day. Um, it just has to announce it, it has to vote on it, and it can change it. Um, but this is um, this essentially in, incorporates what Ray what Ray was saying in a more specific um, with more specific language. Um, I, I, I'm in I'm in meetings every week all the time anyway, so it's a it's all a blur to me. So I I have no um, I don't really feel anything about this one way or the other. I'm just happy to uh, happy to get on with it. So. There's a motion. Uh, so, R R RD, is that an okay reframing of the, the motion that you made to set those specific days? Um, I, I I may have missed some of the nuance, but I um, I accept whatever you said, Jeremy, as a friendly amendment. Let's okay. Move Same. Move okay. Forward. All right. 
Thanks, R.D. Okay. Uh, so can we uh, approve this? You all ready to vote? Um, are there any objections? We can do a roll call if this is not uh, not unanimous. We can also change this right at the next meeting too when we have a, you know, when we're reorganized and reconstituted and whatever. Okay. So are there any objections? Okay. Motion passes unit. Oh, hold on. Michael has an objection. Abstaining. You're muted, yep. Michael. I'm just voting no. If you want to hear my reason, I can give it. But... So if we go to a vote, you don't get to give your reason. Give your reason first, and then Michael, we will. Michael, abstain. I thought I, we were I, voting. Sorry. No, no. I ra Rather than actually asking for votes, I was just seeing if we had it unanimous. Otherwise, I will. If it's not unanimous, I have to do a roll call. It's not so, unanimous. Okay, not unanimous. Great. So, um, whoever is uh, taking notes on this, if you want to, I'm just going to follow along on the um, on the people tab, and I will vote. Um, I, I will vote if I need to to break a tie. But we'll start with uh, Alan Gilbert. Well, I, I think I'm going to vote no because I want to hear what Michael has to say before I vote. <clears throat> What's so we can we can hear from Michael before we start voting. I mean, that's what I was hoping for. Let's hear from oh. Michael before we start voting. Michael, Michael. <laughs> All right. Um, I just I like I like the impetus behind this, but I think it's too regimented for us as volunteers. I liked what Tom had to say earlier. Um, I think each committee. We, we could suggest that certain committees meet before others because the work sort of flows from them, PDC in particular. But other than that, I think each committee membership should pick the time that works best for that group as opposed to the time that's been assigned in a calendar. Okay. Any other, yeah, RD and then Tom? Regiment, a little regimentation is what we need. That's my comment. Okay, Tom? I was wondering if we could hear some um, explanation for why having certain days is advantageous as opposed to leaving it open. Sure, Ray, you wanna take that? So, we, uh, let's see, I'm, on, not, I'm not on mute. <clears throat> so we could have done Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and just had them back to back. Or we could have, and, and if you were a member of all of those committees, you can imagine the pain that you would feel uh, when you did that. Or so, we so I get the I get the suffering it out by weeks, but yeah. as for, for having it on Tuesday and Thursday specifically for specific committees, it it gives it is, so that something comes out of PDC that's going to go to the communications committee. It has to be communicated to the communications committee, and it gives a little breather and a little opportunity for that to happen. Uh, before then stuff trickles down to and through other committees. It's a break. And and it also provides that opportunity for a special meeting if there needs to be a special meeting uh, in between. At least if it's regimented like that, you know when those opportunities for special meetings kind of present themselves, right? And as Jeremy was saying, it's often that uh, the board might have to meet the third week or fourth week of the month, for example. My expectation is, frankly, that the executive committee is going to meet probably twice a month, uh, but there, there are slots available for that to happen. Uh, so that's my explanation. Anybody else have any thoughts or retorts, Alan? So, Ray, just I, I, I want to make sure that I'm not missing something. The, the important point is the weekly structure. I mean, more than anything, it's that certain actions take place within certain weeks in a certain order. Is that correct? Um, there's a benefit to that. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree. So that, you know, the PDC kind of feeds other things, right? And, and right. the executive board feeds the executive committee. And so, yeah, there is there is a structure of that on, on the same 
as by the same token, um, we are not wondering who is scheduled for when um, and whether there's going to be a conflict by having this kind of a grid. I think what people are saying we would know if once the committee is constituted, the committee members can decide on a day of the week that they're assigned to do their work, which particular day of that particular week they would want to meet, and then that would be announced as their meeting date. I just I, I, I get the idea of regimentation, but I think when we get down to the uh, platoon and unit level here, it, it's the people within those the, those smaller uh, units that have to decide what's going to work for them to have their meetings on which days of that particular week. It, it, it just seems very, very hard to arrange something other than that. I, I think they, they just need to have the flexibility. Tom? So just to review the motion or paraphrase the motion at this point is that this is the proposed default calendar and that the committees could change things upon a vote within the committee. Is that correct? Yes. That would work. Yeah. Okay. Any does other? Really, does that need a motion or is that a recommendation that gets handed to the committee chairs to bring to the committees? Well, so setting the the regular meeting date has an has an impact about has an impact on how far in advance you need to put um, your agenda out. So if people if we're saying that the regularly scheduled meeting of the Planning and Development Committee is this date, it's 48 hours they have to have the agenda out before. If it's a special meeting, which is you know, whenever you sort of declare an ad hoc meeting, um, that's 24 hours. So um, you can set those kind of the expectations for the public so that they know they want to come to the communications committee or or what have you. They can look in their calendar and expect that it's there. I mean, ag again, um, so I'm 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 starting to uh, to tip towards Michael on this one, and just leave it to the committees to sort this out, because we may have different committees just depending on. What, what reorg looks like and who gets appointed. I mean, I don't really think that many people are gonna change between now and next month, but uh, yeah. Let's let, let, let's just vote this out one way or the other. So, so the, the motion is to set the schedule, um, is to set the schedule as uh, as posted with the second Tuesday of the governing board and and so on as uh, as listed there in the chat. You know I'll go over it again. So we'll set the regular meeting days <clears throat> to the following days. The second Tuesday is the governing board. The following Thursday is the executive committee. The third Tuesday is the planning and development committee. The following Thursday is the communications committee. The fourth Tuesday is the finance committee, and the following Thursday after that is the policy committee. Okay, so I'm going to do a, we will do the roll call. So if you're in favor of that, you can say yes. If you're not in favor, say no. If you're abstaining, you can say that. We'll start with Alan. I think I'm gonna vote no, because I think this still needs a bit more work. I think it's a good idea, but I, I think we're not quite there yet. Okay, Chuck. Aye. Okay, uh, John Morris. You're unmuted, John, but yes. I, I'm not hearing. Okay, I hear a yes. Thank you. Uh, Josh? Aye for me. Okay. Lucy? Aye. Okay. Uh, Michael? No. Nope. RD? Okay. Ray? Aye. Aye. Siobhan? Abstain. Okay, Tim? No. Okay, Tom? No. Jeremy? Uh, I'm not a board member. I'm an alternate. <clears throat> oh, right. Okay, uh, David? Aye. Okay, I will abstain. And the eyes have it. 
motion motion passes I, those I, are the i'm so sorry to interrupt i'm also an alternate i did not realize i don't know if that changes no, anything you can, you can vote because your 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 delegate isn't here tonight ah thank you right yep but 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 Jeremy's primary is here. Jeremy Matz, the the primary delegate from Plainfield, is here. So you are you are standing in for Katarina right now, and you are definitely entitled to vote. Wonderful. So okay. real quick, what was RD's vote? I missed that. RD's vote was yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Moving along. Um, so that was the board and committee yeah. calendar. The uh, budget policy process. Ray, you wanted an, an item for this? Um, yeah, I had. Uh, am I on mute? No, I'm not on mute. Okay. <clears throat> um, so. Do, 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 do. Hmm. This, this seems a little complicated for this evening to go through. And so I would like to pass and table this till the, uh, till the May meeting. Okay. Thank One you. second. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> a car carrier of last resort discussion. Michael, you wanted to talk about this at our last meeting. You wanted to talk about some of the pitfalls or things that we should be thinking about as we get into um, RDOF stuff and otherwise actually serving people. Uh, I, I remember the discussion. I didn't remember that we carried it forward. Um, can you refresh my memory as to what what we need to discuss still? Well, you specifically asked for time at the next meeting in your um, in your roundtable at the end of the last meeting to discuss some of the oh, okay. pros and cons implications of um, what why it might be a good idea or a bad idea. I think you were mainly looking at why it would be bad. Um, why, why, what would be bad? Being a, a carrier of last resort. Oh, I understand. Okay. So, but none of us have a choice. So, so if you're an eligible telecommunic, sorry, eligible telecommunications carrier an ETC that comes with the obligation of providing voice service to anyone in your designated service area, designated by the PUC. So Rogers Company, Waitsfield Champlain, Waitsfield and Champlain Telecom, well, Champlain Valley Telecom, I got it right, sorry. Um, they are an ETC and they have an obligation to serve anyone in their service area with voice. There is no obligation to serve with broadband but you do have to serve with voice. And that may come, that may change in the next few years, but that's how it is now. Um, it's a burden. It's, they, they, an ETC is able to receive funding from the federal government through the, um, um, what do call it? The, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the, on the fee that we all pay on our phone bills. But, yes. um, of the USF, the Universal Service Fund. So that fee that we all pay on our funds, services such as Lifeline, and ETCs have access to the funding from Lifeline and the obligation to provide Lifeline service and some other services like um, um, uh, connections for the hard of hearing and so forth. Um, so those. Those, those are obligations that most phone companies um, are happy to provide as a service to the community, but, but it is a burden and they tend to wish they didn't have that burden. Certainly, um, a company like Consolidated would like to be alleviated of that burden. And the reason this topic has come up is twofold. One, the RDOF auction, as did the CAF2 auction um, prior 10 years ago um, comes with the obligation to become an ETC and to, and to be the carrier of last resort and to provide those services. So 
um, in CD Fiber's district, EC Fiber, Kingdom Fiber, I think Charter Communications won a couple little blocks, and um, SpaceX won a few. Each of the RDOF winners now must be an EC in Vermont for those locations that they won, and they will pick up that obligation. And they will share that obligation with the existing ETC, which in most of our cases is consolidated. And consolidated will have the right to go to the PUC and request to be alleviated of that obligation in those census block groups that were won by those RDOC winners. And that, that's the whole thing. Um, and in my opinion, it's more a burden than a benefit. Um, others might see it a different way. And it does not refer to broadband service. So there's no such thing as broadband carrier of last resort. That's just something someone might have made up. Um, and CUDs, I think I saw it in some Vicuda discussion um, that CUDs like to think of themselves as the broadband carrier of last resort. But that's just a, <laughs> it's marketing, I guess. So I guess that's all I have to say, and I, I thought I mostly said it in, in the round table, but I'm glad to sum it up again. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that, Michael. Any, if anybody has any questions about that? Okay. So let's, um, let's move along. Um, next one is other towns potentially joining. So um, there was some discussion uh, at the Waterbury Select Board um, whenever they met last uh, at the beginning of the month. Um, I've not heard any updates from that, but they're at least considering um, applying to join CV Fiber. There are also folks in um, Bolton and Jericho potentially um, that they're talking about potentially joining CV Fiber. Um, the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission has also um, put a note out to their towns and cities that uh, it could be possible for them to join a CUD, whether that's us or um, the ones to the north or south, just depending on, on the geography. So I just wanted to put that, put that yeah. out there, um, but I've not heard anything concrete from any town that they're definitely moving forward with it or that they even have it warned at this point yet. So, um, Anybody have any questions or thoughts on this? I, mean, I think we had basically said before, if a town is interested, let them apply and we'll talk about it then. I think that's kind of where we left it the last time. So um, moving along to state and federal funding, legislative action and affordability. Um, the bill that um, spends a lot of federal money on broadband in Vermont is in Senate finance. It passed the House. Uh, Senate finance is the next hurdle to get over. There was a bunch of testimony last week. There, there's more testimony this week. Um, thank you to all of you who sent in your, um, your credentials last week. I kind of did like the quick like two hour turnaround or whatever and I, I stitched together an email that I sent to, um, I sent to every, all of the members of the Senate Finance Committee, because there were some implications that CUDs were generally um, uh, novices, didn't know anything that was going on, couldn't possibly do the work, um, and would not be good public stewards of or stewards of public funding, um, and that it's likely if the CUDs were awarded money, that it would be like another EB5 fiasco, like up in Newport. Uh, that was the, the explicit thing that there was a, a witness that said. So I took all of your awesome backgrounds, very impressive, and I sent a um, sent a note out to the committee. And I got a response pretty quickly back and she says, oh, we know CV Fiber is fine. You're much more mature than all the rest of them. And which honestly felt kind of disrespectful of all of the other folks throughout the state that even though they haven't been around quite as long as as we have or as EC Fiber has, um, that felt like a bit of like throwing the other folks under the bus. So I am I am writing a response there, but I, I did want to thank all of you for the fast response so that I could put that together and get that and get that back to them. So they are, they are aware that we're awesome and they're aware that you're awesome. Uh, we'll see if that makes any difference. Um, anything else? Um, 
trying to think. There's a big discussion of affordability and how the legislature is going to take responsibility for some or part of that. Um, EC Fiber has spun off a nonprofit to um, subsidize folks who can't afford their um, their baseline service, and um, essentially wrote a nonprofit a check for a hundred thousand dollars to essentially subsidize those folks. There is another effort um, to our north in Stowe. There's another nonprofit that was created to do something similar, but they want to go buy uh, Starlink dishes for everybody, which is interesting. I'm I'm not sure that that's really. Um, really solving any problems very cost effectively but there, it's but it's out there anyways um, so um, happy to hear if anybody has any thoughts about that one way or the other or if anybody has anything else they want to add about the state or federal funding that's coming down the pike we have we do have some we have a few minutes to talk about that anyways uh, Michael I saw you had your hand up and then David yeah uh, I think both of those um, initiatives are excellent um, too often, um, um, lower income people get left behind, um, and whether it's to give them, um, the best internet that's available in their area now, or the very best internet that's available in the world later is irrelevant at the moment. What's important is that they get on line and, um, have the ability to participate in society. So I support both of those ventures. Um, and I would like to just modify what Jeremy said about the second one. Uh, yes, the Epsilons and their organization are talking about funding Starlink, but it's not exclusively Starlink. It's the best service that's available in the area that the person lives in. Um, so I know, for example, they want to stand up a Kingdom Fiber customer of their choice at some point with fiber um, to, to, to bring to the attention of the legislature. So I know that they're not only talking about Starlink, um, but other than that, the two programs are pretty similar. Um, one of them is just for the EC fiber area and one of them is a statewide one. Both of them most likely will coalesce in the future. Um, so that's all. Okay, I've got David, then Siobhan, then Jerry. Okay, to give you a little more context, the <clears throat> EC Fiber's nonprofit that they created is a nonprofit going to live off grants and it's forever. And they have set up the nonprofit so that any other CUD could become a partner organization to that nonprofit. The Evslin's family's um, proposal for subsidy is using the three year money that's available in the ARP um, funding coming from the federal government. So it's a three-year program to do subsidies. And it's, so it's it's not a long-term solution, but it certainly does, it's an idea for a short-term solution. Uh, so from that perspective, both programs are great. And when we get ready, I think we're gonna wanna participate, but it, the money runs out after three years for the federal up money. So that's sort of the context between the two programs. All right, thanks, David. Siobhan and then Jerry. Um, I'm glad to hear that about the EC Fiber nonprofit. I was hoping that once we got rolling, we would start something like that. But if we can just join in the EC Fiber nonprofit, I'm all for it because we need just for everybody to be on because that makes such a huge difference. It's going to make such a huge difference. Yep. yep. All right. So, uh, Jerry. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, I, I think we all, we all, uh, agree on, on a lot of different levels about this and it's a little early for us to decide how to do it we're not there yet it's not ripe for decision there are other folks that are trying different things out our financial structure may be totally different from anybody that's in the game right now because you know we could go so much farther on grants than easy fiber or anybody else has so i you know it I don't want this to, I, I know it won't fall by the wayside. Um, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's some way of identifying this as a priority. And when I say this, maybe we even need to identify what this is, but I think 
the, the lowest fees possible and, and, and supporting the farthest extent of the community as possible. But I would just suggest we cool our jets, let's get off the ground, and let's see what's going on out there before we decide which program is the one that we need to jump into. It's good to know that they're out there, and I think we all agree we want to do it. Let's see how it unfolds. We have time. Okay, um, I, I just posted something before we get to Alan. I posted something. It's the the agenda for Senate Finance for this week. If you if you want to watch any of this, there was some testimony today. There's more uh, tomorrow afternoon from VTEL, so you might find that interesting. And then on Thursday afternoon, we're, we're going to be talking about. Uh, I will be there. Uh, FX from EC Fiber will be there. We'll be talking about um, full auditing, make ready, um, and next steps for that. Uh, Alan? I, I've been watching, listening to most of the testimony in the Senate Finance, and one thing that has really struck me and maybe isn't apparent otherwise, unless you watch this day after day and listen to people's comments, the people in the Senate are making no assumption that the House bill is the starting point and they have to work with that. The Senate, as it often traditionally does, even though it's done very little study on the issues behind the bill, and even though it only meets for an afternoon as opposed to a House committee meeting both morning and afternoon when they're not on the floor, so they're spending a lot less time on it. One of the things that happens is the whole bill in a situation like this gets opened up and people start throwing out all sorts of other ideas that are in, in, in some regards in this, in this bill very much at odds with what is in the House bill. The bill that's in the Senate they've been looking at is a bill that actually was submitted late. It wasn't even submitted before the crossover deadline as they call it. So technically, unless you get permission from the rules committee in your chamber, the Senate should not be considering that Senate bill, but it is. It's sort of looking at that as the counterpoint to the House bill. And a lot of issues are just all of a sudden popping up, which, which I thought had been decided a long time ago, and we shouldn't even have to be thinking about. One of them actually is how soon the state might be divvying out some of the, the ARPA money, the Federal uh, American Rescue Plan money. You know, we've all sort of been assuming that very, very, or at least I have, very, very quickly there's going to be a lot of money that gets shoveled out to all sorts of entities and, and hopefully a lot will come to CUDs. And that's not necessarily what might happen. You know, the, the, the Senate's been talking about establishing other schedules, looking at the formation of the um, new authority that they would like to create in a different way. I mean, this, this at times I think things could spin out of control unless somebody starts, starts getting behind a concrete conception that both the House and the Senate are gonna be able to live by. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the process. Each, each time this happens with a bill in the legislature, it, it, it comes out in, in a different form uh, from any other uh, series of bills that go through. And this one has so much money behind it. It's got so much interest behind it. And I think actually the state has hit on this very big issue, that the, 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 the Senate actually has hit on this very biz, big issue of equity of access. And I actually think that's a state responsibility at this point. I don't think that we should have to feel as CUDs or a specific company, be it consolidated or be it, um, or be it Waitsfield uh, Telecom or the Evelyn's operation. I think the state has got to recognize this is a statewide responsibility to all citizens. And because of the vast amount of public money that's now being, being put into this project, I think the argument could be made that people who are not getting served actually have a legal case in demanding that they be given equity along with other people. So I, I, I think this could get, the equity angle especially could get very, very interesting. I totally support what the, C, what the other CUDs have been thinking about and the foundations are setting up and so forth. 
but I think this is going to get much more complicated and I hope much more comprehensive than it looks like it is right now. David. And for anybody who wants to know more about equity, read Alan's book. <laughs> hey, thank you. Yes. Hey, I can write a chapter in broadband pretty soon. <laughs> Lucy. I, I just want to say, Alan, thank you so much. Um, very well said. Uh, I'm on the front lines of higher education. And this year, if anything, has shown us how clearly reliable internet access separates the haves from the have nots. And if you think about the concrete examples of education, finding housing, finding a job, can you even apply for a job without an internet connection now? I don't think so. Um, unless you're walking into Dollar General. Um, so I, I absolutely support the, the idea that this is a state issue um, and equity needs to be addressed on the state level. However, as Alan said, I also fully support any efforts from any grassroots organization to, to help move that along or create that equity in the absence of the state. All right, and so I would encourage uh, all of you, um, if you haven't already reached out to Ann Cummings, if you're a Washington County resident, or if you're an Orange County resident, reach out to Mark McDonald. They're both on this committee, and they are um, both, I, I'm sure that they would both be receptive and would want to hear from you. So I've, you know, they've, they've heard from me, um, and they've heard from me, you know, representing this, this body, but the individual messages they they really do matter. So, you know, you know, Lucy, if you want to send Mark an email, I think just just what you said there, I think that would be great. Um, you know, Alan, if you sent Anne a, a message, I mean, this is the sort of thing that you know, onesie twosie messages to a committee member who's maybe on you know on the fence. I think it's I think it's valuable. And if you have any relationship with any of the other uh, members of Senate Finance, so let's see, Senator um, Pearson. Brock, Sorotkin, Bray, or Hardy, if you know any of them and feel comfortable reaching out to them, they would be good people to talk to too. And it doesn't have to be like we're like all expressing a party line, but in terms of, I, I think H360 coming, that came out of the house was pretty darn good. Um, and then as, you know, Alan's talking about them kind of tinkering around with it, um, it'd, it'd be good for them to hear from you as well. Uh, Alan? One, one of the things, Jeremy, I'm, I'm not sure if all the Senate districts are doing this, but uh, in Washington County, there, the senators, the three senators have office hours on Monday afternoons at five o'clock where they, they, uh, they, they are on Zoom for an hour to take questions from people. Uh, the questions get submitted via chat, uh, but there was one on, on yesterday for the Washington County senators, and, and I, I got in a question about about what was going on 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 the bill, the other thing that's interesting, and Jeremy Henson and I know about this because we've exchanged some emails. The League of Women Voters has come out in in favor of broadband build out, and I, the League of Women Voters is you know more associated with 1920 than I think it is with 2021. But in the last couple of years, they've really become interested in a lot more issues. A number of them being equity issues. And I think it's just fantastic. So if you know anybody who's a member of the league, um, you could talk with them about this, or you could encourage people to say, you know, the league is a great organization. You might want to look into what they're doing. I think there's, you know, there's more and more interest around this stuff. Very good. Any other, any other thoughts or uh, anything else that folks want to weigh in on for this? Okay, looks like we're naturally progressing towards the end here. Thanks to everybody for uh, for your thoughts on that. So let's do uh, let's do the roundtable, and I'll go from the list of people backwards through the list. Um, Tom, you're good. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Siobhan? I'm good. Thanks. All right, uh, Roger. You feel like adding anything?
There you go. Thank you. For, thank you for allowing me to listen in today. Um, I would just like to, to add to, to what Michael said about um, some of the pitfalls of, of wanting to become an eligible telecommunications carrier or be recognized as a quasi carrier of last resort because anytime you put those names upon or those um, thoughts upon an organization, there's always uh, something that uh, individuals want to attach to those obligations. So be, be careful when, when people discuss those those various items. And, and, and in addition, uh, I, I will add that at this point, the Senator, it's Senator Brock's bill that they're discussing there. And while they're discussing it within the committee, it has not been adopted by the whole Senate. So more than likely, at least in, in my viewpoint, I, I think they'll They'll take pieces that they may like from that and add it to what the House has done so that when it comes back over to the House, so at least dealing with what they did pass um, over to the Senate. Uh, so uh, continue to continue to work from 360 as you as you monitor their their sessions. I, I would make that suggestion. So thank you for for allowing me to speak and ha everyone sure. have a good evening. OK, thank, thanks, Roger. Ray. And nothing more. Thank you. Phil, anything you want to add before we close? I'm sorry, was that to me? I, I get booted out, I'm just back. No, no, that's all right. So yeah, so so we're on round table. If there's anything you want to add, any closing remarks or anything? Uh, nothing, nothing at this point. Okay, thanks, Phil. Uh, Michael? Um, I, I was going to pass, but I changed my mind again. Um, <laughs> there, there's there's a lot of bashing going on about the private sector. Um, there's there's no reason that municipalities, CUDs, and the private sector can't get along really well. What what has happened is the national providers have let the state and the country down but the small providers have done everything they could and the idea that private enterprise had its chance and didn't deliver and therefore that solution is now no good and only the municipal solution is good is silly it's really good that we have a municipal solution and it's really good that we have experienced private providers, especially smaller Vermont-based ones, willing to help. That's all. Thanks, Michael. Lucy? Nothing further. Right. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, Josh? I have nothing further to add. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Jerry? I, I just want to, uh, I can't help but follow up on Michael. I, I, I don't think anyone would ever compare you to Consolidated, Michael. I, <laughs> I, I think the folks that are thinking about this and that are deep into the weeds on it know the difference and, and, and understand that. And thank you for all you've done all this time. Now I'm done. All right. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks. Jeremy? Well, I was, I was, let me just say, I was speaking on behalf of other organizations in the state, not mine. <laughs> all right jeremy just wanted to say thanks for all the work that everyone's doing it's a ton and i i for one appreciate it and also thanks to christian for being here and taking the minutes because um i had my covid shot not too long ago and i am not feeling up to it right now so anyway thank you all right well congrats on your shot uh david I don't have much other than saying I, I see lights at the end of the tunnel coming. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thanks, David. Chuck? Nothing more to add. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks, Chuck. Christian, would you like to add anything? No, I'm good. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Alan? No, I've taken enough time tonight already. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's, that's that's what we're here for, to, to talk about this. And we technically still have two more minutes on the agenda, so I should be I should just continue talking, right? So I'm just going to say thank you. Um, have a wonderful night, everybody, and we will uh, see you soon. Good night. Good night. Good night.